thank Isabel for her <laughs> dedication and her uh, willing to take the children. And Mariah, okay. And anyone else is in involved, so okay. Big ones up here, the little ones downstairs, okay. If you fit that category, go wherever you're supposed to. <laughs> All right, we're going to continue our study in the book of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and we did start uh, last uh, week, uh, the first two verses of 4. But anyway, uh, just like to remind you, on the book of Ephesians, there are six chapters total. The Apostle Paul, of course, is the writer, and the first three chapters, the first half of the book, is uh, concerning doctrine. Now, when we say doctrine, what do we mean? Well, we usually, we usually think of doctrine as those uh, uh, deep portions of Scripture that we study and analyze and so forth and really find out what the Scriptures are really saying. And that's, that's really what doctrine is. The basic meaning of doctrine is the teaching. And... Uh, so we're, we are looking at, really, the first three chapters of Ephesians was the, the teaching of the Apostle Paul to us believers as members of the body of Christ as far as our position in Christ is concerned. And uh, we know that's a marvelous thing, what God did for us through his mercy and his grace, that upon believing in him, that we have a position in Christ for all eternity in the heavenlies. And in that position, we find that we are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and so forth. We, because we are in Christ, which is a phrase that the Apostle Paul uses. Uh, now, a while back, I heard several times that the, that particular phrase, in Christ, in whom, and so forth, in the book of Ephesians, is used about 49 times. Well, now just lately, the same person who said it was 49 times is now it's, is up to 96 times. So I don't know what the difference is there. He just kind of doubled it. But anyway, <laughs> I haven't gone through the book of Ephesians myself to see what it, uh, how many of those times that it is, it is used. But the first three chapters are, are what we call doctrine, our position in Christ, and so forth. And also we see in chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul reminds us believers our condition prior to salvation, what we were like, what we were involved in, uh, following the prince and power of the air, uh, the spirit that worketh uh, uh, disobe or, uh, disobedience in, in that particular time before we were saved, and uh, reminds us, as Gentiles, we were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. God was not working with the Gentiles, all the way from Abraham on up until the first part of Acts. Uh, so God was only working with the nation of Israel, which uh, is very surprising to a lot of Christians. They do not quite understand that. And that is one of the key things to understand as far as understanding the scriptures. That the two uh, programs that God has in the scriptures, a heavenly and an earthly program, the earthly program pertaining to the nation of Israel and the heavenly program pertaining to the body of Christ. And those are the two programs that God has in the, in the scriptures. And we see primarily the uh, biggest share of the scriptures are dedicated to uh, God working with the nation of Israel. And of course, we see in the Old Testament that the, uh, we say, well, what happened to the Gentiles then? Well, <clears throat> they had a chance in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and uh, we know what they got involved in idolatry and all kinds of stuff so God set them aside and started a new nation through the person of Abraham uh, the Jewish nation and from that time on the choosing of Abraham Genesis 12 all the way up until the first part of Acts we have God working with the nation of Israel now you say well how could he just leave the Gentiles not even working with them at all well the program that he set up through uh, the nation of Israel through Abraham was that as soon as the nation of Israel would believe and, and uh, put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God, they would take the good news of God to the Gentiles. And that's uh, back in the Old Testament prophets. We see it many times uh, listed that they were to take the good news to the Gentiles. 
And even in the uh, so-called Great Commission, we see that they were supposed to go to all nations. So that's carrying out the Old Testament prophecy, uh, which was given in the Old Testament, that they should go to the Gentiles. But we know what happened is that the, the nation of Israel rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they rejected the Holy Spirit. They uh, rejected the entire Trinity. And when that took place, God set the nation of Israel aside, which is approximately Acts chapter 7. They set the nation of Israel aside and temporarily brought in the age of grace, which we are members of today, which we are living in today, the age of grace and beginning to began to form a body of Christ, a heavenly body, a heavenly organism that God is now forming in this age of grace which we are living in. And as soon as the rapture takes place, at the end of that age which we are living in, the age of grace, God again will pick up his prophetic, prophetic program with the nation of Israel and again will work with the nation of Israel through the tribulation period until the second coming of Christ. Uh, okay, so now chapters 4 through 6 of Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul, or Jesus Christ, through the Apostle Paul, is giving us some direction on our Christian living. And that's where we're starting in, uh, in chapter 4 here. Now, you'll notice in the first verse it says, I therefore, well therefore, you've got to ask yourself when you see therefore, what is it therefore? And he's referring back to the first three chapters of Ephesians. He says, I therefore, since I've shown you this, that you are in Christ, you have a position in Christ, your condition before you were saved, and, and also the fundamentals and the basic foundation of the gospel of the grace of God, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and we know he's several times he's called the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or beg you that ye walk worthy of the vocation or actually calling wherewith ye were called. You might have ye are called, it's really uh, we're called past, past tense and uh, the word for vocation is really calling. Some translations even have calling instead of vocation. Now what is the vocation? Well the vocation is your calling unto the Lord Jesus Christ, your salvation and your position in the heavenlies which Paul has already described in detail in the first three chapters. So the vocation and the calling really go back to the first three chapters uh, where Paul is describing our position in the heavenlies with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, wherein ye are called. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.8, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Many times the Apostle Paul refers to himself as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he is... He is contained, he is in Christ, and he is the administrator of the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, in Colossians chapter 4, it says, Continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. Praying also for us that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Uh, notice it says to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds or a prisoner. That's why he's a prisoner. One of the reasons why he spent a lot of years in prison himself, in a literal prison, because of speaking the mystery of Christ. Back to verse 1, it says, Therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. Worthy means nothing more than... Uh, uh, suitably in a becoming manner. That's the way we ought, to, we ought to walk in our Christian life. In a becoming manner. And we'll see more what that actually means as we go on. In the vocation, the real meaning of vocation or calling is our position in Christ. And that's all, was all explained in Ephesians chapter 1. Calling. Paul uses it ten times. Nine times as a divine calling, and once as an occupational calling. 
in uh, <clears throat> it says in Ephesians 1 4 it says according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love that is our calling when God chose us he called us and notice it says before the foundation of the world uh, that we should be holy without blame before him in love it's a it's a truth that we begin to understand as we read Paul's epistles that God chose us uh, by his uh, his own desire he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world uh, maybe that's kind of hard to understand uh, but uh, we'll probably go more into that as we go on through uh, Ephesians here but anyway he says I in Philippians 3 14 the Apostle Paul says I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God speaking of his calling a high calling of God it is the Lord Jesus Christ who called the Apostle Paul to his apostleship uh, in uh, the book of Romans uh, chapter 11 he says I am the apostle to the Gentiles and I magnify my office in 2nd Timothy 1 9 he says who has saved us and called us with a holy calling now he's including everybody himself and all those in the body of Christ called us with a holy calling not according to our works we were not called because we did something uh, remember God is no respecter of persons it's only because of his uh, if his desire and his his uh, uh, plan from all eternity past uh, not because of anything that we have done but because of his graciousness his his uh, his mercy his holiness well the holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began Hebrews 3 1 says wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 Paul again he says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing but fruitful pleasing who pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work Christendom today has, for the most part, has got that turned around. That is, the more good works we do, then the more that we are possibly going to make it into heaven. Uh, you ask the, the majority of Christians, how do you, do you know that you're going to heaven? Most of them will say, well, I hope so. Well, what did they base that on? Did they based on how many good works they're doing, how many... If they go to the, go to a church every Sunday, or maybe even a Sunday school teacher, or whatever, all the good works uh, is what they they refer to, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, our good works come after salvation, and that's what the uh, Ephesians chapter two verse ten, uh, where we are His workmanship, and called unto good works which come, of course, after salvation. Verses 2 and 3, Ephesians 4, it says, With all lowliness, or humility, and meekness, gentleness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that, that is our goal, and that is the goal of the Apostle Paul in pointing these things out, that we need to live in a holiness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, upholding one another in love. For what reason? To keep the unity of the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, in the bond of peace. The more you understand the scriptures, and especially rightly divided, as, as, as individuals, and you come together and have fellowship together, the more unity that you will have. And that's one thing I really appreciate about this particular assembly is the, is the unity that we have in Christ. Because once we understand the scriptures that we are a member of the body of Christ, that we are all in Christ, in the sphere of Christ, 
then we can have fellowship together and that bond of peace is, is there and the unity of the Spirit. Now that's why he mentions it and then he goes on and explains that more. Uh, just some definitions here. Lowliness means humility. In other words, a modest mindset or frame of thought. Humble-minded. Modest mindset. Uh, I just want to go back. When we started here, I mentioned the first three chapters were uh, doctrine and the second three uh, Christian living. You know, a lot of believers, they're either on one side or the other. Uh, I've known especially uh, grace ministers, <laughs> uh, especially really get involved because they start understanding the scriptures and they really get involved in doctrine and understanding the scriptures and more and more and more involved in doctrine, but they forget about the really Christian living. We need to have both. That's why the Apostle Paul starts out with our foundation as being a, have a position in Christ, in the body of Christ, but then he goes on to Christian living. And we need to have both, Christian living. And then you have the other side of, of that truth about Christian living. I know I've heard people in churches say, well, we don't need all that doctrine. All we gotta do is just live, or live our Christian life, pleasing to the Lord. Well, guess what? You can't live a Christian life pleasing to the Lord if you don't understand doctrine, the very teaching of the Word of God and what's involved, your position in Christ, and, and so forth. So, lowliness, modest mindset or frame of thought, humble-minded, meekness, mildness, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering. We know that uh, in 2 Peter, it says, uh, God is not willing that any should perish. Uh, I guess that's not in Peter, but it, uh, Peter says that God has long-suffering, that none should perish. Forbearing one another in love, which means in the sphere of unconditional love. Unconditional love is from the Greek word agape, which is uh, translated love. And a lot of people uh, say, and that is true, that agape love is really God's love. You want to call God's love? Uh, uh, there are several words for love, translated love in the scriptures, and agape is used most of the time, if not all the time, for, uh, for God, for God's love. It's unconditional, and that's the love that he has for us, and that's the only way that you can understand and, and uh, know his grace unconditional love uh, shows his grace, his matchless grace towards each one of us. There is one, one place though um, where love, uh, the word agape, is translated into love and it is in John 3, uh, 17 I believe it is, but right after John 3, 16 it says where men love darkness rather than the light. Love darkness, that's that copy. So that just explains to you how men sometimes can love darkness unconditionally. They love darkness or sin, darkness is referred to sin, more than the love of Christ or the light of Christ. I think that's the only time that a copy is really used in that, that respect. Okay, endeavoring or being diligent. Being diligent, that you, you, you strive and you want to know more, you want to do more, to keep the unity or the oneness, unity is oneness, of the spirit in the bond of peace. If we are keeping the unity of the spirit through our fellowship, through the study of the word, we, you know that we will experience the peace of God the oneness of the Spirit. Now he goes on to kind of explain that. In the oneness of the Spirit, he says there is one body and one Spirit. One body, what's he referring to? He's referring to the body of Christ. There is only one. There is only one body of Christ. There is not another. 
There's only one spirit, spirit being capitalized, it's the Holy Spirit. Now, there are other spirits, that's not what he's referring to, but he's talking about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or our relationship with God is to in one spirit. Spirit, Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. In our calling, when Christ, God, called us into become a member of the body of Christ, there's one hope for us. And that is, of course, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ at that day of redemption when the rapture takes place and we will be with him forever. In Titus 2.13, he writes and he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a good verse for all uh, those also, uh, the JWs or the uh, Mormons, when they believe that Jesus Christ was just a person, he was not God. But what does this verse say? It says, the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There he is, God and Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.14, it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that should be each one of our goal is to press for the, the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In other words, to live our life pleasing to him. Uh, so at the high calling of God, or at the rapture or whatever, um, we know that there are rewards for those who have uh, produced good works, been involved in, in uh, the right fellowship with God, uh, learning his word and so forth as a believer. And we will be rewarded for that in the future at the great white throne judgment in the great choices. Scratch that, not the great white throne judgment. The Bema seat of Christ. <laughs> If you're at the great white throne of judgment, uh, I'm sorry, you've missed the whole thing. <laughs> great white throne is only for unbelievers. Okay, that's the end of the thousand year reign. So make sure that's straight now. Philippians 3.20, the Apostle Paul says, For our citizenship, or our conversation, is translated, it should be citizenship, is in heaven. That's our citizenship. Remember, we are already there spiritually. We have a position, a spiritual position, in the heavenlies with Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2 tells us we've already been raised with him. Through his resurrection, we are identified with him. So our real, our spiritual position is in Christ in the heavenlies already. It is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior. The same place where we're looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, come back to get us. The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You hear the question a lot of times, well, okay, we're going to get a new body. Well, what kind of body is it? Will we look the same? Will we be the same age? Will we, uh, a lot of things, you know, will we know other, our friends and, and so forth? Well, it says, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Well, what type of body did Christ have after his resurrection? He spent some time on the earth, at least 40 days, uh, 50 days, uh, on the earth after his resurrection. What type of body did he have? Well, did the uh, uh, believers or the apostles recognize him after his resurrection? Sure they did. I mean, first of all, they didn't think he was going to raise uh, from the dead, so they really doubted it. But then after they once they had heard that it was him, they recognized him. They knew him. They, he, had the, he still had the nail prints in his hand uh, after his, his crucifixion. So he was recognizable. What, could, what was one of the things that he could do with his new body? He could just appear any place he wanted to be. He could move on an instant, on, on thought. Uh, and uh, remember he, he appeared amongst the 12 after his resurrection, after about a week of his resurrection, all of a sudden he appeared in the midst of him, of them. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he was gone again. And I think we will be able to do the same. 
Okay, one Lord. There's only one Lord, the Apostle Paul says, or Lord Jesus Christ says to the Apostle Paul, there's only is on one Lord. Well, what is Lord? Lord or Master? Uh, we say the Lord of our life, the Master of our life. There's only one, one Lord of the universe, the Master of the universe, and of course that is between, that is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The only way a human being can have fellowship with God, the Father, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Uh, anytime you want fellowship with God, look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the earth, when the 12 apostles asked him about well, what does the Father look like and what does he say? He says, well, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So they are one as one God. The only mediator between God and man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, prior to the, prior to the uh, <clears throat> crucifixion, uh, who, what was the mediator or who was the mediator in the Old Testament? It was the priest. The priest was a mediator. And the, uh, the high priest was a mediator between God and the nation of Israel. Uh, but not any longer, we find in Hebrews that Jesus Christ was the high priest. So once that he um, was presented as the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ presented his blood to, on the mercy seat in the heavenlies, then now he is our mediator between us and God the Father. One faith. Now one faith can be, mean a lot of things. A lot of times today, we may ask another person, well, what is your faith? Or they may ask uh, you, what is your faith? Well, what do you tell them? What is your faith? You know, you might, you might have reference to, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Congregationalist, I'm a Methodist, or whatever the case may be. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying here. What is the faith? And if you look at most of the times when he uh, uh, has faith in this, in this context, it is the faith with a definite article in front of it. But what is the faith? It is the gospel of the grace of God. It is the, the gospel which God had given the, uh, the Apostle Paul to present mainly to the Gentiles, but to the Jew and Gentile alike. Now this is just some references where he calls, he says, my gospel in Romans 16, 25, remember 16, 25 says if you want to be established in God, in, 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 uh, in the faith, uh, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And of course the mystery is that gospel of grace of God, uh, which contains many different truths. He says our gospel, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And, of course, he's speaking about himself and the other apostles that were with him at that particular time. You know, there's Barnabas and there's Saul and there's several that, that were with him, Timothy and so forth. They were called apostles. He says, our gospel, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And he, he tell, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, he says, the gospel preached by me. And, of course, that was the gospel of the grace of God. In Acts 20, 24, the first time that you see in the scriptures the gospel of the grace of God mentioned is in Acts 20, 24. The gospel of the grace of God. He also refers to it in 1 Corinthians 9, 12 as the gospel of Christ. In other words, the good news of Christ. And you know, that, <clears throat> that is really uh, kind of peculiar to the age of grace. Uh, is in, in, in the mystery. You don't see the gospel of Christ as such mentioned prior to the Apostle Paul. Yes, there's good news about Christ prior to that, but here we have the, the gospel of Christ. And we have the gospel of the glory of Christ. Well, whoa, what's the glory of Christ? It's uh, what God, through Christ, has done for us and sees us. Sees us. Uh, that we will be glorified. In fact, Romans 8 uh, also says that we have been glorified with him. There again, speaking of our position in Christ. 
This one faith is the gospel of salvation for us, for Jew and Gentile today in this age of grace. It is also re referred to as the gospel of peace in Ephesians 6.15. The gospel of peace. So <clears throat> I've heard people say, well, there is only one gospel in Scripture. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I guess you could, uh, if you sum it all up, yes, the, the, whole, the whole Bible is, is about the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the good news that God has through the Lord Jesus Christ in some reference or another. We really don't see it and understand it in the Old Testament until we get to the New. But then uh, we see what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And there are actually many Gospels because back to the Old Testament. What was, what was the good news that uh, um, Abraham received from God? Was it, that the, was it that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for your sins, believing in the blood, shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for you? No, Abraham didn't know anything about that, and the Lord didn't expect him to. God didn't expect him to. But what, did, what was the saving message that Abraham uh, received or believed in that he was saved? That God told him that he was going to be a father of many nations that he's going to be his uh, uh, he, he, he would he would have uh, a nation that was uh, as of the stars of the heavens or of the sand of the seashore uh, that his seed would be a blessing to all the people on the earth that's in uh, Genesis 12 1 and also Genesis 15 Okay, so there are many different Gospels. Then we get in the New Testament, just so we're skipping a whole bunch here, but we're getting in the New Testament. What was the Gospel the Twelve Apostles preached? Well, it was the Gospel of the Kingdom. Not about the Gospel of the Grace of God. It was the Gospel of the Kingdom. Um, John the Baptist preached that before Christ even came on the scene. He's preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom. Uh, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene uh, shortly after the, uh, John the Baptist. He preaches exactly the same thing, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Many times you hear today, well, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that's the spiritual kingdom that everybody's a part of. No, it isn't. The gospel of the kingdom was a physical kingdom that was going to be established on the earth. And that's what the Old Testament talked about all throughout the Old Testament. That's what... Uh, John the Baptist, that's what Christ referred to, that's what the, the 12 apostles alluded to, was that gospel of the kingdom when Christ would set up, come back on the earth as their Messiah and set up rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years. That is the gospel of the kingdom. And we know uh, that even the Lord Jesus Christ says that will be the gospel that will be preached during the tribulation period after the body of Christ is removed. From this earth, by the rapture, goes right back to the gospel of the kingdom, which was preached just prior to the beginning of the age of grace. One baptism. Here's where a lot of people really get, uh, I don't know, upset or really did not know exactly what the scriptures really teach about baptism. Now, I know when you think of baptism, what's the first thing you think of? water. Well, that's because of our religious religions and denominations that we have today, we've had for years and years and years. And of course, they do not understand that God changed his plan for the Gentiles uh, in forming the body of Christ, and uh, which baptism is entirely different. Now, there was water baptism under the, under the uh, age of the law, which was in the Gospels, and uh, when Peter says, repent and uh, be baptized for the remission of sins, it's water baptism. They needed to repent. Repent of what? Repent of how they, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. To have a change of mind. That's what repent means. To have a change of mind. To have a change of mind, be water baptized, and then you will receive the Holy Spirit. 
altogether different than our message today. Today, you know, how many times you, does the Apostle Paul uh, tell us to repent for salvation? We don't see it. Now, there is some verses that are connected, uh, secondary to repentance, and when a person is saved today, is he naturally has an attitude of repentance. Uh, if you don't, and then there might be something wrong. But, but anyway, it's, it's not a command to do to repent for salvation today. It's to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, what he's accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Okay, so one baptism here in Ephesians 4, it says, one, for by one spirit, I'm sorry, in this one baptism is in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which it says, for by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body? So what's happening here? It is the Spirit, capitalized, the Holy Spirit, that baptizes us into one body. No water whatsoever. It's, call it dry if you want, but it's no water. It is the Spirit which actually is identifying us, putting us into the body of Christ. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, doesn't make any difference. Whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit, into one spirit. And that is the message for today as members of the body of Christ. There is one baptism, and this, this is the spirit baptism by which the Holy Spirit baptizes or identifies or places us into the body of Christ. So how many more baptisms are there for the body of Christ then, the age of grace? Zero. This is the only baptism. If there's only one baptism, which is it? Is it water baptism? Or is it being baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ upon believing? That is what it is, the Spirit baptism. At the, at the moment we believe goes back to first uh, uh, Ephesians 1 13 it says in, on uh, upon believing in the Lord Jesus Christ upon believing the scriptures the Holy Spirit baptizes us and seals us unto the day of redemption Ephesians 4 30 also says that, that the Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption once we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption we cannot lose our salvation and uh, it's all by the grace of God. It's all by his mercy and his grace that this is all accomplished. We do not have to do any works. We, all we, only thing we have to do is believe in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us already. Uh, Galatians 3.27, Paul writes, he says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, there it is again, by the Holy Spirit, we have put on Christ. So not only are we in Christ, but we have put on Christ. We are in him. We are part of him, the body of the <coughs> Christ himself. Um, okay, verse 6. Well, this is Romans 6 here. <laughs> know ye not that as so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. In the baptism here, you'll find out that it is we are identif identified with his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and so forth. His crucifixion, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And that's what we are now studying in, on Wednesday evening, Romans 6. We uh, discussed this kind of at length last Wednesday night. Colossians 2, it says, Buried with him in baptism, where also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. There again, we're identified with his death and uh, his resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, How important is baptism or water baptism in this age of grace? Well, what does the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1, 17? He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If you are, believe that you need to, need to be 
water baptized today, especially for salvation, you are making the cross of Christ of none effect. Because the cross of Christ paid it all. There is nothing that we have to do physically to become a member of the body of Christ to be saved simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul never, in all of his writings, never commands anyone to be baptized. Only at 1 Corinthians uh, 1.17 there we see, and he's alluding back to the early writings back in Acts, which is a transitional period from the age of the law to the age of grace. He, he did, he baptized a few, and he names them there. And some of them even forgot. But once the full revelation of the mystery becomes known to the Apostle Paul in the end of Acts when he's in prison, never does he ever mention water baptism once again, or the speaking of tongues, or the, the miracles that were, that were uh, taking place under the dispensation of the law. Uh, we could go on and on on that. But anyway, uh, in verse 6 here, we'll, we'll finish this one in verse 6. He says, one God and Father of all, who is above all, he is through all, and he is in you all. Wow. One God and Father of all. There's not, there's not more than one God. Now I guess I gotta clarify this. There's not more than one God that is the creator of the universe, that is the God, uh, Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There's only one. There's only one creator of the universe. And that, of course, was God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was the one that created the universe. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 tells us that. Uh, John chapter 1 tells us that. That he was the creator of the universe. So there's one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all. There is a, a, a book that was just recently published. Uh, uh, the name but just slipped my mind here. Um, anyway, it talks about the gods, plural, small g. Now back in ancient, ancient Israel, ancient times, there were lots of gods. Egypt was involved in worshiping Hundreds of gods, different gods, all small g, not the gods, but small gods that they were involved in, and that's why they become involved in idolatry, and that's why uh, so many um, things happened to the nation of Israel, that God destroyed uh, part of Israel, Jerusalem was destroyed, and so forth, was because they forgot about who the real God was, the one God and began worshiping idols and all kinds of gods. So there were hundreds and hundreds of gods at one particular time, as there are today. There are several today also. But uh, there is only one God of the universe. Notice Ephesians 1.21 describes it a little bit. He says, far above all principality, the speaking of God, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet. The Lord Jesus Christ, all things are under him, under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Uh, we could have a whole sermon just on that last phrase, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all in the body of Christ. The entire universe, the, the entire principalities and powers in heavenly places, uh, they all are looking at the body of Christ. They're looking at us as members of the body of Christ as we display the matchless grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy in, in God forming the body of Christ. So uh, that kind of uh, behooves us, makes us kind of humble at times. Hey. You know, the entire universe is watching us, really. And uh, it is, we are the restraining force, as what is uh, mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
And when this restrained force that we, have, we hold as members of the body of Christ, where the Holy Spirit is working through us, when that force is taken out of here at the time of the rapture, you can see how the tribulation period is just going to go wild. <laughs> uh, it'll be literally hell on earth at that particular time for those seven years. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the information that we can gain uh, to know you, to know your character, uh, to know who you are, experience the glory, your glory. And we just thank you for <clears throat> what you have done for us, that by simple believing in you, we can have a, a life pleasing to you. We can have a life with you for all eternity. We look forward, Heavenly Father, to that rapture. We think it is, it is getting close. Uh, when we will uh, be with you for all eternity. Be with us now wherever we go. Uh, keep us safe, Heavenly Father, that we might be able to come back and have fellowship together once again. This we ask in your precious name. Amen.